Well, thank you for having me here this afternoon. Uh, I think I'm, uh, by the fact that I'm here, you're almost at the cocktail hour, so you're, you're in good shape. So let me uh, kind of give you a quick introduction, maybe through the lens of my personal story. So uh, I used to own 21 car dealerships in uh, four different states. So of course, I'm here talking about blockchain. That's the natural connection. Uh, but the way that actually happened was about four years ago, my youngest son came home one day and said, Dad, I got one word for you. I said, what's that? He goes, Bitcoin. He goes, take all your money and sell everything you have and invest it in Bitcoin. I said, well, what the hell is Bitcoin? So he went on and on and on. So I called my financial advisor at Bernstein. And I said, hey, Shane, uh, my son says I should take all my money out of Bernstein and put it in, in Bitcoin. He goes, well, please don't do that. But uh, uh, Bernstein's been studying the underlying technology blockchain for a long time, and it's really fascinating. And you should think about that. So that's led me through a journey for the last four years where actually Shane now runs Onum, uh, which is our, our tech incubator. And uh, so what we want to talk about today, or what I want to talk about today is kind of what's gotten us to this point. So I'm going to flip through a couple quick slides. Uh, this is maybe how data was transferred a while ago, and then you flip forward. Uh, then it got a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, then, of course, uh, mobile devices were invented. Um, and <clears throat> then we went into uh, a little bit easier uh, access with computers. Let me just pause there as we, we went into the computer age and the internet. It's interesting because I remember when I was in college, so I, I graduated in 1989, and uh, I was on a computer back then. You guys who are my age or older remember how that used to work. It was about a 20 minute process just to get a prompt. And my roommate came in and said, what are you doing? I said, hey, I can type stuff here on this computer and people in other computers uh, elsewhere around the country can see what I'm typing. He just looked at me and goes, that's just stupid. And uh, so here we are today, uh, you know, 30 years later, uh, the information age is just absolutely uh, nuts. And unfortunately, a lot of the data on the internet is fake. That's a, a term I think we hear around DC a lot, right? Fake news. And cyber theft is, as you heard from the panel, a huge issue. Uh, as Shane said, if a bank was attempted to be robbed right now in Georgetown, it would make front page news tomorrow. But yet, Banks online are attempted to be robbed six million times every single sing uh, solitary day, and there's no news about that. So, so the uh, digital economy has created great uh, parts, but it's also created a lot of problems. So you either can do this with your data, put it in a Fort Knox type situation, uh, or do what most governments do, which is put their data in a bubble. Uh, and the challenge with that is that uh, the data that the government holds is very valuable, and they keep it so tightly controlled that it allows, it basically doesn't allow any data sharing at all. So along comes blockchain to kind of break that trust gap. And uh, I put this in here just to see that you guys think I'm a tech person. All right, so, um, no, that worked. Uh, but here, obviously, we understand the timeline. We're 10 years into this thing. A uh, lot of noise around cryptocurrency from 16-year-olds to 60-year-olds uh, talking about this great craze. We had the hype. And with that comes everything else. Like if uh, you would think about the dot-com era during the 90s. There was an enormous amount of noise. Then, of course, the tech bust happened, and everybody said, well, the tech world is dead. Of course, that was the opposite from the truth. So we're now in the application stage. So really, what, what is blockchain? Now, obviously, in this group, you probably have a very, very good idea how to answer that question. I'm certain that your friends, acquaintances ask you that same question. And really, the answer depends on your perspective. So what we've looked at is trying to get away from this idea that uh, uh, separating cryptocurrency from blockchain. It's two different concepts. There's a, a, a good quote that you've seen many times around what, how blockchain relates to Bitcoin. And then, uh, but when you talk about it from a government perspective and a business perspective, there's still a lot of explanation that needs to be. So if you go into a government agency and you're talking to them about blockchain, they can say to you, uh, they, can, they can say to you, hey, hey uh, on a quick Google search, wait, you're trying to sell me Bitcoin? I mean, I can't tell you how many times in Cleveland when we talk about uh, being great at blockchain that I hear people think that I'm out creating my own cryptocurrency. So there's a huge issue. So one of the things that we've tried to do is explain new technology using old technology ideas. So we've come up with this idea. Everybody who uses it for the rest of the day gets a free Mercedes. All right, so this is, I want to make sure you're paying attention. All right, so it's what we call a belted solution. So rather than saying, hey, we're going to use blockchain to solve a problem, 
we talk about putting, like we you'll see here in a second, we talk about car titles. We're going to put belted car titles. And so what that means is an acronym. You can see what it stands for, a blockchain encrypted ledger that's executable and distributed. So you get away from the idea of blockchain. Now, to everybody in this room, this looks like just a marketing way to reframe a private blockchain or a private distributed ledger. Yes, that's the whole point, right? <laughs> because the conversation has gotten very difficult, especially when you're dealing with government authorities. So it's, our, it's the way we view blockchain. So obviously, we understand what encryption means. I don't need to go over that with this group and, and how you can use a private key, public key, so you can ha maintain anonymity between uh, users. Uh, you have this idea of uh, uh, executable. We t you heard the panel talk about that as a, as a point of no return. I totally agree with that. And of course, the idea of a distributed ledger. And if I pause here for a second, so think about that. Is it blockchain encrypted? Is your ledger blockchain encrypted? Is it executable and is it distributed? As those being the three thresholds in which you should use this kind of system. Because part of the hype problem that's occurred is that you have a lot of companies, a lot of vendors talking about blockchain solves everything. If you want a cup of coffee, you can do that with blockchain, right? So, and that creates a problem because it, it creates an aura of, is this snake oil? So to get away from that, it's, blockchain isn't gonna solve every single problem. So we look at belted, again, encryption, executable, distributed. So let's talk about kind of how we're, uh, we're I'll skip through this real quick, how we're using it in our, in our, uh, in our company. So we started a company we hope to launch probably in about a dozen or a couple dozen states this fall uh, taking car titles. Uh, people ask me all the time, it goes, oh, this would be a great application for real estate. It is, except way too many people care about real estate and titles and deeds and make a lot of money. Nobody gives a crap about car titles. Uh, car titles easy, right? I said that to the Registry of Motor Vehicles one time and uh, uh, the registrar got very insulted. He says, people care more about car titles than voting. I'm like, okay, you've been at your job too long. Um, <laughs> <right>? <laughs> so what we do with, with uh, titles is something you don't think about because as a consumer, typically you go to a car dealership, title, they take care of the titling, and your bank or your leasing company holds on to this crazy piece of paper. But think about the idea that in 2019, that the government issues you a physical piece of paper that represents the fact that you own an asset. It seems like an odd concept. So what we've done is, I wanna walk you through quickly, uh, you can see some of this uh, on the screen, how it affects all the parties in the system. So if you talk about car dealerships, I know that very well. I'll give you an example. My, my Mercedes dealership in Cleveland, where we sell probably two, 300 cars a month. We have five people, that's all they do all day is take this piece of paper that starts as a manufacturer's statement of origin, the paperwork that the client signs, you know, when you go into an office, it's not just to sell you a bunch of crap, it is to do that, but we also have to sell, uh, have you sign a bunch of papers. Take all those documents, we drive it over to a physical office, it then gets printed out as a new Ohio title, and it comes back and either gets mailed to a bank, a leasing company, or to the client. It's an enormous amount of work. And if you look at it from the lender's perspective, that title, so if you buy a car from me and finance it through Bank of America, I mail Bank of America your title. They have to receive it, look at it, okay, whose loan is this? File it away somewhere. Then if you pay off the loan, they have to figure out that you paid it, take this title out of an envelope, mail it to you. In the meantime, that can take two or three weeks, and the bank on average gets four or five phone calls from every client, where's my title, where's my title, where's my title, where's my title? It's crazy. So it costs them a lot of money. The insurance industry, if you've ever had a car stolen or totaled, it takes about 90 days for the claim to clear. Most of that is because they're waiting for the ownership document of the vehicle, and it's extremely costly and cumbersome to them. Of course, for the car companies, how many of you in this room get recall notices for cars that you haven't owned since you were a kid, right? You're like, I haven't owned that hoopty since I was 18, right? And yet, the government puts a lot of pressure on these car companies to get these recalls done. The Takata airbag recall is a great example. 60 million cars recalled. Imagine if the car company can send you a notification to your phone, your car's been recalled, press here to see what it's for, press here to make an appointment, and it's all done. You can do that because your title is now lives on a belted system instead of living in your file folder or in a bank vault somewhere. So those are the kinds of things that we can do by digitizing what used to be uh, now a physical piece of paper. Private sales, you have the quandary, the conundrum of I want to sell you my car, 
you want to buy my car. So we're good there, right? And we've got video technology. We can see the condition, et cetera. But now I say to you, okay, I'm going to mail you the check when you sell me the title. And you say, no, 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 no. You send me the title, I'll send you the check. And then you have this conversation back and forth. You hang up on each other. You go to a car dealership and buy a car. Right? Now, we love that, by the way. Right? But maybe private parties don't like that so much. So imagine you can send a title the same way you send a text message. And through our system, it validates the sale price for the state authority within the bandwidth that they want, clears the registration fee, uh, the title fees, clears the sales tax, transfers through a smart contract the title to you, transfers the money to the seller. All that like that, a snap of a finger. You can also take a loan. If you've ever been to an auto loan, title loan place, somewhere you're probably having a bad week, maybe a bad month, <laughs> a bad year, right? And you're gonna pay 28 plus percent interest or in a good, in a good day. You could take your phone out and say, hey, listen, I got a 2015 Mercedes. I need my money for my tech startup. I'm gonna, it's worth at least 50 grand. Hit a button and thousands of lenders can bid for your business and maybe you get a 4% loan. You hit a button, the loan comes to you, title goes to them all instantaneously and the state doesn't have to process any of that manually. It all happens electronically. That's what we're working on at, uh, at Champ. Uh, like I said, we're hoping to launch uh, at the end of this year with 2021 models and newer. And then from there, we got some other ideas. But what I wanted to share with you is just a different, A, what we're doing in Cleveland, B, what we're doing at Champ, and C, a different way to talk about private uh, blockchains rather than using that word that, that's the same as maybe sometimes wearing a MAGA hat, right? If I wear a Make America Great hat uh, in DC, it means something completely different it does in the suburbs of Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, depending on your perspective. So blockchain has that same issue. So we said, let's just get rid of that and let's talk about belted solutions. So with that, I think I'll take questions if uh, you have that. And if not, you're one step closer to drinks. So CHAMP, an acronym for anything? No, thank you for asking. So CHAMP is uh, 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 the name of a person who holds a title. So CHAMP, he's a CHAMP, so he holds a title. We're not very creative. <laughs> <laughs> we have our birth certificate program called Historic and our death certificate program called Reaper. So we're not very creative up there in Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> the, the blockchain that you use for this? Uh, for, for recording the assets and for, for trading title, I assume this is something proprietary. And if so, I'm I'd be interested to hear why you made a proprietary choice rather than using one of the um, open source uh, you know, community projects that are on the, on, on the market. What are the considerations in, in, in your mind there? Sure. No, actually, we use Hyperledger Fabric. So we are, we are uh, an open source system, absolutely. And, and actually, we're uh, very fortunate to uh, partner with uh, or to work with KPMG and IBM to help us build this solution up, which is, they've been two great, great partners on this, on this project. What states are you launching in? We want to launch in Ohio because obviously we're in Cleveland, right? So we want to start with our own home state. Uh, Matt, if any of you are from Massachusetts and ever bought a car there, it's an incredible process in a really bad way. Um, I had dealerships there. You have to f literally fax over documents. It's kind of crazy. So uh, Florida, Massachusetts, uh, we, Delaware, um, uh, o uh, Oklahoma, Nevada, Wyoming, and I think I'm probably missing this, uh, and Kentucky. Those are the states that we're talking to now. And eventually what we want to do is create a 50-state solution. So, we have, so really what we can do is the data is incredibly valuable. Uh, you know, right now if Mercedes-Benz wants to know how many cars are being sold, they call the sales managers at 379 dealerships and say, hey, how's business? Ah, oh, it sucks. Oh, damn. Right? And they, they quantify that somehow. <laughs> Instead, we could tell them on an instantaneous basis how many titles are being transferred, and we can give them aggregate demographic information. So they launch a new car, like the new A-Class. We can tell them, hey, uh, males between 25 and 35 that live in the zip code are buying these cars, and they've bought it in this, this sort of way. They traded in these cars. So really exciting about that. So I think with that, my time is up. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll be available for a cocktail, however you want to talk further, and we have a booth outside. All right, so thank you.